笑了。Doctor's Companion presents Doctor Who, The Long Way Round, the weekly podcast where we review and discuss every episode of Doctor Who, one doctor at a time. I'm Cassandra Fredrickson. I'm Nick Jimenez. And I'm Scott Corelli. And today on the show, we'll be discussing Silver Nemesis, the seventh doctor's seventh story. Woo. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. This is the penultimate uh, serial of uh, season 25. And uh, it is written by Kevin Clark and directed by uh, Chris Clow. Uh, Chris Clow, who directed um, last season, uh, directed – what were the two episodes that he did? Uh, Dragonfire and Delta and the Bannerman. Nice. Whoa! Yeah. Um, and so uh, he, uh, he directed this alongside The Happiness Patrol. So he also directed that. Because yeah. um, the the whole the whole concept of um, production uh, during this era of the show was a uh, one studio one entirely studio production and one entirely location production, and it, we they used the same director for both. Um, and so last season for that was uh, Delta and the Bannerman was the location uh, story and Dragonfire mm-hmm. was his studio story. And then this season, uh, the Happiness Patrol was his studio story. And this Silver Nemesis was his location story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So then um, uh, the writer, Kevin Clark, this is his only Doctor Who story. And he had no interest in writing for Doctor Who. So, of course, John Nathan Turner, uh, uh, being the uh, the always wise producer of Doctor Who, uh, gave him the 25th anniversary episode. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this episode, part one of Silver Nemesis, was airing on November 23rd, 1988, which was the exact uh, 25th anniversary. That's why it's Silver Nemesis, because it's the silver anniversary. Oh. Oh. That's why it's the... S- that's why it's the Cybermen, because silver, sure, and silver and silver. Um, why not? It, yeah, and just like a silver anniversary, uh, silver anniversaries only uh, uh, kryptonite is uh, a gold uh, anniversary. I guess I don't know. Um, anyway, the Daleks, the Daleks uh, <laughs> are gold. Yeah, that's true. Who's Does the, the most... Daleks defeat the Cybermen? That's Who's the thing. The most... Yeah. Yeah, you are better at dying. Yeah. Dying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, it, so, it really, you know you can you know a line is iconic when you can even remember like the cadence of it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> So Kevin Clark had absolutely no interest in writing Doctor Who or any science fiction ever. Um mm-hmm. he he didn't uh he didn't much care for that particular genre. He thought it was beneath him. Uh but uh he wasn't getting any work. And uh, Andrew Cartmel, the uh, uh, story editor at the time, um, was looking for fresh blood. And, you know, why not reach out to someone who has no interest in writing for the show that you're running? (laughs) Sure. Um, So uh, so he uh, hired someone who never wanted to write for Doctor Who uh, to write for Doctor Who uh, Mm -hmm. begrudgingly because he was out of work. Really, just bang up job uh, across the board. Everybody, um, let's. I really wish more yeah. shows would just hire people who Re- don't want to write for the yeah, show. Re- real Amanda Waller level like room gathering. <sighs> well, it, I mean, it's not just that, but it's just like it's 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 just uh, I. Why get somebody who likes the show to write the twenty fifth anniversary episode? I don't know. C- crazy, I know. It sounds nuts, but <laughs> just an idea. Um, Andrew Cartmel. 
uh, mostly I'm just frustrated with this particular thing. I actually like Andrew Cartmill as a yeah. as a script editor in general. <laughs> sure, um, sure. I'm just really mad about this. Uh, this is this was a stupid decision. Um, and uh, so yeah, so he came up with this uh, this this idea that like you know had all of these things about like the 1600s and uh, uh, neo Nazis who were obs- like obsessed with. Um, supernatural uh religious artifacts the same way that uh hitler was and uh yeah so he like created this thing and then john nathan turner was like well it's a silver anniversary so you know we should also have the cybermen and uh uh you know uh, after asking who the cybermen are kevin clark was like okay fine i guess i'll add them um <laughs> uh, so so uh yeah so he was given this uh three part story and uh John Ethan Turner uh actually wanted to fill this with cameos so there's a there's a scene in um I think it's episode 2 where there's mm-hmm. a bunch of uh tourists um outside of uh Windsor Castle yeah, and all yeah. of the tourists yeah all the tourists are 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 people who have worked on Doctor Who in the past um including huh. uh, uh uh Brigadier what? Um, he was yeah he's in, he's in the group <laughs> he's not playing brigadier i don't think i think he's just playing a tourist yeah. but he's there um yeah so they uh they wanted to do that and then the other thing that john nathan turner wanted to do uh was get uh prince edward earl of wessex to be uh have a cameo as himself uh, during the uh, Windsor Castle uh, segment, because Prince Edward was like really into the entertainment industry, and he was working as a production assistant for Andrew Lloyd Webber at the time. Uh, but unfortunately, Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, declined allowing uh, Prince Edward the time off uh, to uh, be on Doctor Who, and uh, so instead, they uh, uh, you know had to cast a uh, lookalike as his mother. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, and presumably uh, lookalikes for her corgis. <laughs> um, so uh, that happened, and uh, then um, you know we uh, there was this other uh, uh, this other thing that I thought was really funny was that um, you know a lot of people uh, they talk a lot about um, in the history that I read about. Uh, uh, many of the uh, cast members of that, you know, how they were cast in this particular story. Um, but I think my favorite uh, bit of casting was uh, the guy who plays, what is his name? Um, it was uh, the guy, the guy who plays like uh, the lady's assistant. Um, What's oh, the character's uh, name? Oh, yeah. It's Richard. Richard Maynard, played by Gerard Murphy. So uh, the only reason that he agreed to be on the show, he actually he read the script, didn't understand any of it, thought it was extremely confusing, didn't really know what kind of part he was playing, uh, really just trusted in the director. The only reason that he agreed to be on the show was so that uh, he could be in England during Wimbledon so he could watch Wimbledon on TV in between uh, in between uh, scenes. Um, oh and because God. he couldn't watch Wimbledon in uh, Wimbledon in uh, France, I think, which is where he was living. So he only agreed to be on the show so he could watch uh, Wimbledon. Um, that's one of the coolest things I've ever. I guess heard. that's it's good enough reason, I suppose. <laughs> that's crazy. Respect. Yeah. He's like, I don't, I don't know what this Doctor Who crap is, but I want to watch Wimbledon. So sure, I'll be in your stupid little show. <laughs> <laughs> and he played well the part. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He, he did okay. Yeah. Silver Nemesis Part 1, written by Kevin Clark, directed by Chris Clow, produced by John Nathan Turner, script edited by Andrew Cartmel. Air date 23rd of November 1988. On November 22, 1988, a group of neo-Nazis calling themselves the Fourth Reich are made aware of a comet that is on its way to Earth. They seem excited by this for reasons that will become clear later. In 1638 England, a mathematician calculates that something called the Nemesis Comet will fall to Earth on November 23, 1988. The mathematician tells this to a woman who is a good shot with a bow and arrow named Lady Penafort. 
She seems excited by this as well, for reasons that will also become clear later. The Doctor and Ace, meanwhile, are chilling at a park while listening to live jazz musicians when an alarm goes off that the Doctor is having trouble remembering why he's set. They head back to the TARDIS to investigate, but are attacked by hidden marksmen and barely escape. Using a special boom box that he got Ace to replace her broken tape player, the Doctor realizes that the reminder has something to do with the destruction of Earth. Back in 1638, Lady Penafort, accompanied by her trusty manservant Richard, uses a black magic potion to time travel to 1988 so they can be there when the comet falls to Earth. She uses a glowing silver arrow to locate the comet's crash site, while the neo-Nazis have a matching glowing silver bow and do the same. The three groups all converge at the crash site, and we learn that the comet is actually a silver statue called Nemesis. The neo-Nazi leader, De Flores, demands that the Doctor hand over the arrow so that they can add it to the bow they already have and allow for the Nemesis statue to become fully operational. While the Doctor truthfully tells him that he does not have the arrow, De Flores threatens Ace's life regardless. Just then, a spaceship lands, distracting the neo-Nazis and saving Ace's life. But the inhabitants of this spaceship are no heroes. They are the Cybermen. So, um, like Nick was saying before we started recording, uh, I like that one of the enemies for Doctor Who is officially neo-Nazis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Get screwed, (laughs) neo-Nazis. You know, what's weird about the neo-Nazis to me are, I mean, other than them being neo-Nazis, because that's a stupid thing to be, um, (laughs) it's, uh, it's that the, they're like, they're like U.S. military neo Nazis. Like they're like, they're like a combination of like the Nazis in like an Indiana Jones movie, uh, yeah. and and like the U.S. military because they wear like camouflage, which is like the weirdest thing to see a Nazi in for some reason. Like imagine if in real life now when there's like a neo Nazi rally and everyone's like, oh how terrible, but then you look out your car window and it is just like a bunch of raiders of the Lost Ark extras, like. <laughs> In camo. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. And the leader of the neo-Nazis looks like uh, like, like the guy who uh, drinks from the wrong cup in uh, Last Crusade. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's such a Saturday morning cartoon yeah, version of a, of a neo-Nazi, which is kind of the whole vibe mm-hmm. of this, this era of the show, and including yeah. Happy Time Patrol. Yeah. Happy uh, Time Patrol. Nazis, <laughs> Nazis in uh, camo. Uh, weird, uh, but <laughs> sure. yeah. kind of kind of like makes them sillier, which I also like. Uh, and then also the this episode just opens with like a Nazi on a computer, like doing maths. <laughs> and it's it's just I don't know. It's just really funny to me. I don't know. He's, he's doing extremely important calculations for his yes. racist nonsense, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> ah, yes, yeah, this, okay. math, this math proves that the Aryan race is mathematically better than any other race. <laughs> God, wow, the Nazis really are Daleks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just angry, stupid, prideful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, isn't, and that, then the, isn't that the point? Yeah. The, and then the leader guy, like, sees that parrot, and it's just, like, picks yeah. up a bow and arrow, and it's just gonna, like, <laughs> knock it out of a tree. I agree. I, I agree with the Nazi. I, I did not like the sound that parrot was making. It was very human-like. <laughs> well, yeah. Probably because it was. Oh, man. How, how often do people just look at birds outside their window and decide to shoot them with bows and arrows? I mean, if it's this episode with the abundance of bows and arrows that are in yeah. this episode, in, in this story, <laughs> Imagine uh, probably if, like, more often than you'd think. Imagine if, like, in the middle of one of the Avengers movies, they're, like, hanging out, and you're like, ah. and Hawk is like, oh, hold on. <laughs> Dude. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Money. Oh, uh, man, they really need to recast him. Oh, uh, heaven, heaven don't have a name. Oh, God. So, so what's funny about this story sure. is... um. All I could remember about it was there was a lady with a bow and arrow. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And 
It starts off with a Nazi with a bow and arrow, and then we see a lady also trying to shoot birds <laughs> yep. on her lawn. Yep. Um, but in the 1600s instead of, what, the 80s, 1988? Yeah. I thought Lady Panafort yeah. was a, a very cool villain. I really liked her taking out Cybermen with bows and arrows, mm. just screaming about yeah. how she will own everything, all will be hers, and like... <laughs> I was she about is, it. She was really, I, I, yeah, I really liked her. I just wish that like there was more of a focus on yeah. like somebody for sure, like yeah. <laughs> like either the Cybermen or the neo Nazis or her one or like a- any of them. Like I don't know why we needed like four groups of people in this story, uh, mm. but and and you know what's funny is we have four groups of people in this story, and you'd think wow. Four groups of people, and there's three episodes. This must like go like lightning. This episode, but then episode <laughs> two is like completely unnecessary. Like we could really cut this story down to two parts, and you would lose nothing. Yeah, and that's All really of... saying something uh, in terms of how many characters are in this. Right. All of the episodes when I was watching it felt so long for some reason. Like, they felt like 45-minute long episodes, but they weren't. They were, like, 25 minutes. Yeah. I, I, I'm starting to sense Great. this this new, this classic Who trope where things sort of feel almost, like, kaleidoscopic. Or, like, there's just a series of things stapled together. And, mm-hmm. like, a patchwork. And you're like, well, I like this part. Or I like that part. But then you kind of feel how disjointed it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Also, uh, the Doctor and Ace are really into jazz in this episode. Uh, uh, and did Damien Chazelle direct this or what? Man, <laughs> I was because we were so I, you know we were so uncomfortable and sad last week about the way Six treats Perry, and so to just the scenes of like Doctor and Ace just like hanging out in the garden and like listening to jazz and just like having chilling out were just really enjoyable for me. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh man. That's good. I love them together. They have yeah. such good chemistry. Yeah, they do. Won- They're really, really good. She got her little uh, she got her cassette signed. <laughs> yeah. She did. Um <laughs> Man, when they're going back to the when they're going back to the TARDIS from the from the their little jazz picnic. Uh, and uh, they start getting shot at, and there's that there's that one moment where the neo Nazis uh, shoot them while they're going over this little bridge over a stream, and then they just both yeah. dive into the stream. I I burst out laughing. I don't know what was so funny about it, but I just thought it was the funniest. <laughs> it was just yeah, there was something. I feel like the timing was just slightly off. Like they jumped into the water before the shots happened, mm-hmm. or something. <laughs> um, so it just looked it just looked ridiculous like they were trying to like uh zag instead of zig or something i don't know <laughs> like, yeah. let's pretend well, we're going to go across this bridge and then just dive into the water it was super like synchronized swimming yes like <laughs> it's really yeah. you know uh. you you forget that like student teacher tropes can like be endearing and not creepy and then you see Ace and the Doctor, where it does feel like a cool professor and like a kind of weird student. Yeah. 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 Um, Lady Penafort and uh, Richard, her assistant. Uh, I I love the moment where they're going to drink the uh, – they, they drink the time travel potion. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, my God. And, and they just start screaming. For a <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're just screaming as they are taken into 1988 and appear in the middle of a restaurant and just screaming. It's kind of a cool effect because I fell for it. I, you know, you get lost in like them screaming and the color effect. Then the weird like witch's mm. hovel that they're living in becomes just like a, a bar, like a, like a, a, a pub. And just old people are just like, what the hell? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And- <laughs> <laughs> what are you screaming for? I know the the little old lady's just trying to have lunch next to them. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I I honestly I really love part one of this. Like, part one of this is so good. And I was like, oh man, this is going to be a great episode yeah. or a great story. Mm-hmm. And then parts two yeah. and three just, are like womp womp. Um, basically, the Cybermen show up, and it's just I like will womp say, womp. Though, <laughs> like, 
when the when when the Cybermen arrive, I I don't know. This is actually kind of one of my 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 rebel Cybermen stories. Yeah, because they're not go. trying to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, just something about their design and their voice, and just yeah, they're they're the way they're implemented. They're not like this looming terror. They're kind of like cool Flash Gordon stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. They look like they look like Captain EO characters. They're like yeah, the cool <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese eighties. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is what it looks like. Um, the doctor, an alarm goes off for the doctor, which I, which I like, and you can't remember what it is. And, uh, Ace is just making fun of him. Yeah. Ace is just making fun of him. And then they figure it out. They use her boom box, uh, or as they put it, ghetto blaster, um, (laughs) to (laughs) figure out what, what, uh, his alarm is for. And then they realize like, oh, right. It's. Because Earth is being destroyed. That's right. That's that's what it was. <laughs> um, so when is uh, Earth being destroyed on this show? Yeah, I know. I mean, this was bad enough that he set himself an alarm. So I guess that's something <laughs> um, like a true millennial. <laughs> yeah. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, I like being in Windsor Castle and and seeing uh, Queen Elizabeth and her corgis running around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the doctor like being like, oh, I know that face is like classic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they're like behind the corner, and he's like, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> the queen will know what to do. Look like a fool. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So the Cybermen show up at the end of this, uh-huh. and honestly, Ace thinks like- that they're Ace thinks that they're her, her friends. Yeah, oh, my hero. They saved my life because they she was going to get shot at by Nazis. Yeah, they saved my life. She's, uh, I really <laughs> like how anti Nazi, uh, anti Nazi Ace is. Oh, hell yeah. She's the original punk. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah, she's pretty dope. I yeah. love her jacket. I love her tape deck. Yeah. I love her backpack full of bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't? The Cybermen, that's who. Yeah. Ace is the best. The, the end of this episode is literally just the Cybermen walking out of their ship. Silver Nemesis, Part 2, written by Kevin Clark, directed by Chris Clough, produced by John Nathan Turner, script edited by Andrew Cartmel, air date 30th of November, 1988. The neo-Nazis open fire on the Cybermen to no avail, but when Lady Penafort enters the fray with gold-tipped arrows, the Cybermen start to go down. In the confusion, Ace and the Doctor manage to obtain the Silver Bow and escape to the TARDIS. Going back to 1638, the Doctor surmises that the mathematician that first calculated the date of the Nemesis landing on Earth must have gotten help from the Cybermen, hence their appearance in the present. Meanwhile, the Neo-Nazis strike a deal with the Cybermen to work together on gaining control of the Nemesis. But the Cybermen are lying and plan on killing the Neo-Nazis when it's all said and done. Lady Penafort and Richard gain access to Nemesis, but are taken captive by the neo-Nazis. The Cybermen arrive to see Nemesis become operational, but while they now have control of the Silver Arrows, they realize that the case containing the Silver Bow is now empty. The Doctor is convinced that more than one cyber ship is nearby, and upon scanning for a fleet, the Doctor finds thousands of hidden cyber ships surrounding the planet. Cyber leaders like, oh, it's the doctor. Blah. I like, <laughs> I like the Cyberman voices, but whenever a Cyberman dies, it's always the same sound effect, and it was very jarring to hear over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And just kind of the Cyberman wailing in pain just seemed uncharacteristic to me. Yeah, I don't know. Like I feel like they always from- do that in, uh, yeah, in like classic Who. I feel like they always do that. Okay, yeah, that could totally just it's be... It's New Who that they don't really... They, yeah, they don't really scream much in New Who because they don't have emotions, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, that, and that's my version because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a baby. <laughs> no, nobody's shoving gold in their chest, so they don't have to listen yeah. to you. Uh. <laughs> what is... Has that ever yeah. come back from Classic Who? Like their gold allergy or whatever? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I miss that. It's really silly. It is really silly. I mean, I just love, like, she's just, 
like Lady Penafort is just like sh- firing gold tip arrows at the Cybermen and taking them out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's pretty great. dope. I like it. She's so confident this whole episode, and I was just I was into it. Yeah, there's only a few things that I remember from this episode because uh, this episode is incredibly forgettable. Like, I, if you told me to to recount the plot of this episode, I would not be able to do that. Um, but well, I got some bad news for you. Uh, you got to recount the plot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Good thing there's a Wikipedia. Um, but uh, 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 yeah, all that I know is like I la- there's that scene where the Nazis are making d- a deal with the Cybermen, and mm-hmm. uh, one of the Nazis like calls calls women barely human, and I'm like, Jesus, this is. <laughs> Wow, I don't remember that part of the Nazis. I I, I know about the race stuff, but uh, I didn't know the, about the women stuff. That's uh, well, I mean, I it's mean... not su- it's not surprising. Oh, that's just that guy's personal opinion. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're all dudes, man. The other the other Nazi says that, and the other Nazis are like, "Whoa, whoa, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Oh, hey, guy." <laughs> Nine, hey. nine. Nine. Easy, nine, easy. Nine. And they're making the they're making like the neck cutty, like neck cutty, like Ooh. cut it out like Ixnay, Ixnay. <laughs> no, do it on the reef install. We think she's cool. <laughs> oh man. Um. She's a witch. <laughs> Uh yeah, and then, and then we get the uh, the episode ends with the revelation that there are invisible Cybermen warships surrounding mm-hmm. the planet, thousands, thousands, which what is uh, pretty cool. In I guess this episode. I, I think that's there's, what I'm saying. I don't know. There's llamas. Okay, okay. So they made like the funniest Shakespeare joke, and I laughed for like five minutes because I'm a nerd. Um, because oh, he he's scared of the llamas because they sound like bears, and she's just like, "Well, the bear won't pursue us. That only happens in theater." And I had to pause it and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Um, I wanted to highlight a, a moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there's a moment where uh, they're walking, they're getting ready for like the final showdown or what have you, and Ace like takes aside the professor and is like, "Hey, like I'm really scared." Like, I know I usually roll pretty hard and I have a bag full of bombs, but, like, I'm scared. And the doctor's like, you can go back to the dark. She said, wait, if you want. And Ace is like, no, doctor. No, she calls him doctor. And I was just like, oh, that's – I don't know. I was like, that was a really cool companion moment. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Ace pulls tail. up a ship. Yeah. Ace, Ace pulls, pulls up, up a ship. all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's just in general. She's, she's, she's real uh, – She's real into blowing stuff up, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing really happens in part two. She just blows stuff up and then <laughs> it's, whatever. It's the worst. So. It's the worst. Somebody like I, you know, I'm. I would say like somebody had to waste their time writing this, and then I remember who it was, and I'm. Uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> Screw I'm Kevin Clay. <laughs> yeah. Just doing so, Doctor Who for the paycheck. Uh, Kevin Clark. Silver Nemesis, Part 3. Written by Kevin Clark. Directed by Chris Clow. Produced by John Nathan Turner. Script edited by Andrew Cartmel. Air date, 7th of December, 1988. Without the bow, DeFlores attempts to renegotiate with the cyber leader, but the cyber leader orders him dead. DeFlores barely escapes after throwing gold dust at the Cybermen and fleeing, but then he dies soon after by getting shot by a Cyberman, so it really didn't matter. The Doctor and Ace sneak into the hangar containing the Nemesis statue. While Ace distracts the Cybermen with sling shots of, full of golden coins, the Doctor puts the silver bow in place and the statue comes alive. He orders the statue to destroy the cyber fleet when the time comes, and it seems to understand. Lady Penafort demands control of the bow in return for keeping the Doctor's secrets that he has been keeping from Ace. The Doctor calls her bluff, ceding controls of the Cybermen instead. The Cyber Leader tells the Doctor to make Nemesis join their fleet so they can use it to turn Earth into the new Mondas. 
the doctor gives Nemesis the cue to do what he ordered, and it begins to take off towards space. Lady Penafort leaps for Nemesis and somehow merges with it as it sends itself to space and destroys the cyber fleet. The cyber leader attempts to kill the doctor for his ruse, but Richard comes out of nowhere with a gold-tipped arrow and takes him out. To thank him, the doctor and Ace return Richard to 1638. Later, Ace asks the doctor about his secrets that Lady Penafort had been talking about, but the doctor doesn't answer. So this whole, like, um, living metal statue thing, I don't know, because that's a thing. That's a, a plot. Uh, oh, and it looks so cool. I really like Nemesis. Mm. I thought she was a really cool character. The um, So, like, okay, the living metal only activates when all of the pieces are together. So that's why there's, like, three pieces. And then it comes alive, and the doctor's like, hey, do this for me. and <laughs> <laughs> Help me out, buddy. Come yeah, on. Yeah. Why is this so long? <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. I just, I'm just realizing something. I'm just realizing something about this. In, in a way, not, not entirely because it's not limbs necessarily, but in a way, the plot of this episode is very similar to, was that, what, what was the, what was the two-parter from Buffy with the judge? Oh. The judge? Uh, I don't. Mm. Wait, is that the yeah, thing the that was after? Aunt? Remember, they put all the parts yeah, together, yeah, and then she yeah. blew them up. It was. Yeah. It was the no. It was early season two. Season two and, and the mall, right? Season two, because that, well, that's when Angelus Angel is around, bad. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to a new millennium, or whatever she says. Huh. I haven't thought about that in a while. That was an ace move for sure. She blows something up. Hell yeah. She uses a rocket launcher. Uh yeah, it just <laughs> reminds me exactly of that storyline. Yeah. Mm. Oh man. But that's like way better than this. <laughs> well sure. Well, I mean, that, that's season two <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer cast. Yeah, I mean it improved upon it, but I'm saying it's the same <laughs> it's the same thing. It's uh yeah. little, little, all, a, an all powerful thing that everybody wants and they all have parts of that parts of it. Seven year old Joss Whedon was on his little couch, he's like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it would be cooler if it was a demon though. Being, Seven years old. You know, he was like <laughs> <laughs> Buffy came out like 10 years after oh, this. True. Yeah, so 16 year old <laughs> Joss Whedon. <laughs> Be cool if it was a demon and a blonde chick blew him up with a bazooka. <laughs> Someday. I do. Um, the thing that I like about this era of the show in general is the. Um, all the like do- heavy sort of Gallifrey and like Doctor Lore. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, with Omega and Rassilon and like the nameless third person who I don't know. We well we'll we'll get to it. We'll get to it eventually. It's interesting, but I don't think it really goes anywhere, and that kind of bums me out. Mm. That's fair. Well. It got canceled before he could do the the thing that he wanted to do. Right. I guess that's true. Uh, kind of, you know, like at the end of it, when it's just like the doctor, like kind of parlaying with the Cybermen it, it, and going into what Cass was saying about the mythology that comes into play. I really mm-hmm. like it when the show is the doctor being a, 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 a piece on a chessboard. Mm hmm. And he's just maneuvering around it. And there's all of these like alliances and mythology that he has to deal with. And sometimes that can be a lot more interesting to me than him being like a galactic do- do-gooder, which is also a lot of fun. Yeah. But it, I don't know. It reminds me of like the Moffat stuff that I really like as well. I think that you'll really like um, the next, the last season of um, McCoy then, because they lean really hard into like chess master doctor. Oh, uh, awesome. Yeah. I uh I one other thing that I forgot to mention during the uh the uh uh production stuff um which was I hated everything that I heard about Kevin Clark <laughs> but the thing that I hated the most about Kevin oh, Clark boy. uh was 
was that uh, he actually, when he pitched this story, he actually pitched it as the story that would reveal that the doctor uh, isn't an isn't just an alien. He is actually a god who walks among mortals, uh, and uh, has. Has uh, let me let me see if I can find the thing. It was uh, it was the worst thing. So let's see here. Um, uh, Clark's interest in making uh, the the question of Doctor's identity is a key part of his serial. At one point, Clark wanted to reveal that the Doctor was God, or at least a godlike figure who walked amongst mortals and possessed tremendous powers, but sometimes let events run away from him. And uh, Nathan Turner uh, was basically just like, that's that's stupid. And also, I don't want like religion to be a part of this show (laughs) because that is also dumb. Uh, But uh, that's why um, they went with uh, Nemesis as the villain, because it was like a Greek goddess thing. And he was going to be a god and that was going to be a god. And it was going to be like God versus God. Oh, yeah. It was uh, uh, this guy does not understand this show and had no business writing it. I mean, he kind of, he, anyway. he, he, I don't know. That's, I mean, there's like a kernel of interesting things that I feel like knew who did better with like vengeful David Tennant. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's, kind that's of like weird. threading that needle a little more finely. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't saying he was a God though. They were saying he was started to think of himself as a God, right, which is right. like a different, that's a different yeah. thing. Yeah. Sort of qu- questioning the nature of what a God is to society. Like that weird one where he meets Satan. <laughs> right, right. Um, my favorite part of this episode, though, other than the the chess game, like Ace beating the doctor at chess, mm-hmm. uh, other than that, um, which I think is the moment where he decided he was going to make her a time lady. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because he was just like, wow, you beat me at chess. That's pretty dope. Um, <laughs> anyway, I think that... Uh, Play my I, tape! <laughs> <laughs> I think that my favorite part of this is when Lady Penafort is when Richard is hitchhiking and Lady Penafort is sitting at a bus stop just muttering to herself, "All will be mine." Oh yeah. She just really goes, like all will be mine. She's sitting at a bus stop. I, I really <laughs> liked when they were riding in a car with that lady from Virginia, and mm, uh, yeah. and she was like, "All will be mine." She was like, "Yes, it will. Yes, it will." <laughs> She's very supportive. Like I, I would have loved if she was just like, "Yes, Queen. Yes, it will." Yeah. <laughs> In her heart, she was. Yeah, and like she didn't we know never that turn of phrase yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, <laughs> this was fun. The story is uh, weird. Bro- Broad City wasn't a thing yet. It is a right? weird story. There's too much in it, but it's also too long, but kind of too short, and just like. It's just, it's just, there's just too much of everything. Too, mm-hmm. too, too much. Um, and it's, uh, but man, part one is great. I love part yeah. one. It's the yeah. other two parts that aren't great, but thankfully there's only two of them. So. <laughs> Can you imagine if this was like six? God. Oh. So well, much there- running around and there, there would be, there would be twice as many arrows being tossed around. Yeah. If- if two of those were just Ace and the Doctor just like chilling with their sunglasses on and listening to jazz outside, I'd be I'd be down. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's fair. Yeah, fair enough. Just uh, Ace and the Doctor like uh, getting into it like a chess competition. Hmm. I think While we can win a little bit jazz? of money, Ace. I think we can win a little bit of ch- 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 cheddar, ch- cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, why is why is the doctor Monterey Jack from Rescue Ranger? Uh, oh my gosh! Who knows? Both have questionable fashion uh, taste. <laughs> yeah, uh, some great Sylvester McCoy. It really, yeah, it feels like one of those episodes where it's elevated just by how much I enjoy watching this Doctor companion yeah. pairing. Very true. Um, like if it's it a was lot of like fun. six or Perry, that would be horrible. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, it would be a nightmare. Um, <sighs> that being said, I think <laughs> that uh, the next Seventh Doctor story that we get to talk about is going to be Nick's favorite. Period. Uh, I'm excited. Which yeah. which one is that? Uh, the uh, uh, greatest show in the galaxy. 
Oh, shoot. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm into it already. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, space circus. Uh- <laughs> yep. Space circus. Life is... Life is a big space circus, Ace. <laughs> <laughs> Only imagine imagine that, but but rapping. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, <sighs> good lord. Well, well, I think that is Silver Nemesis. I think so. Silver Nemesis. It sounds like a bad guy from like eighties comics. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um. But if you have thoughts about Doctor Who or this story <laughs> or whatever, uh, <laughs> Doctor Who thoughts, join our Facebook listeners group. Um, what is it? It's the um, Doctor's Companion yes. listeners group. It's yeah. very, very Same. creatively named. Um, you can support us on Patreon if you haven't yet. Um, go to duelinggenre.com slash support. Thank you very much if you have. And if you haven't, well, please consider it. Um, if you feel like throwing money our way but don't want to do Patreon, we also have a tea Public store, which you can access from DuelingGenre.com slash merch. Fat, stupid robots incoming. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I want one. And uh, when you're doing your holiday shopping, tis the season, um, use DuelingGenre.com slash Amazon, which is our affiliate link, and we'll get a cut of um, that. So... That'd be awesome. Next time. Christmas and is coming. It is. Next time we're talking about Chimes of Midnight, and I'm really excited slash scared. <laughs> but in a good way. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a good one. The only the only uh, downside of us uh, covering it next week is, like, I wish we had covered it in time for Halloween, because uh, it's, a, it's a nice, uh, yeah. a spooky, yeah. spooky, moody, gothic spooky. story. Yeah, it's real good. So uh, mm-hmm. anyway, Chimes of Midnight. Nice. If you guys haven't been following along with our Eighth Doctor stories, I highly recommend uh, listening along for Chimes of Midnight because it is very, very good. So uh, check that one out if you mm-hmm. haven't listened to any of them yet. And uh, we'll talk to you next week with that one. Bye, everybody. Mm-hmm.